Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. What is more powerful genomics or proteomics? I think this has been a long debate. What is more robust, more powerful proteomics based investigations or genomics based information? However, today's distinguished scientist Dr. Henry Rodriguez is going to provide you a new answer that a field proteogenomics which is now emerging can provide us much more meaningful and more powerful information. Dr. Henry Rodriguez is director of Office of Cancer Clinical Proteomics Research at National Cancer Institute NCI National Institutes of Health in USA. Dr. Rodriguez research has focused on understanding mechanisms of cancer and age related diseases including development of molecular based technologies in basic, translational and clinical sciences. Dr. Henry Rodriguez has led to the development of NCI's clinical proteomic and proteogenomic research programs which today includes the world's largest public repository of proteogenomic sequence data and targeted fit for purpose assays. His efforts has led to the formation of two cancer moonshot initiatives, the International Cancer Proteogenome Consortium ICPC and the Applied Proteogenomics Organizational Learning and Outcomes Apollo Network which he developed and co-developed. Dr. Rodriguez has been very supportive to also include India as a part of ICPC initiative and India has now become the 12th country to join this consortium to look at the cancer proteogenomics research for cervical, breast and oral cancer. Dr. Henry Rodriguez will give an overview talk of clinical proteomic tumor analysis consortium CPTAC which is one of the efforts from NCI to accelerate the understanding of molecular basis of cancer through the applications of large scale genome, proteome or proteogenomic analysis. He will also brief about how NCI is working and taking the translational cancer research to the next step. Dr. Rodriguez will talk to us about how genomics and proteomics together in the area of proteogenomics could make much more meaningful impact. The importance of proteogenomics and how the robust field can reveal answer to different biological questions will be addressed. He will then bring various facts that laboratories worldwide should follow a standardized workflow to obtain reproducible data sets. Dr. Rodriguez will also talk about how proteogenomics is providing new prospects in recent projects of CPTAC like ovarian cancer. So, let us welcome our distinguished colleague Dr. Henry Rodriguez for his lecture. So welcome everyone. So my name is Henry Rodriguez. I'm the director for the National Cancer Institute's Office of Cancer Clinical Proteomics Research. And I have to admit, it's been extremely exciting and flattering watching over the past several days this idea of looking at the proteomics based information and trying to now blend it more and more with the rich history that has come out over the past 15 years in the genomics landscape. So what I thought that I would do is to, is to give you sort of an overview of what we've been doing now at the National Cancer Institute, really for about 12 years, where we see it going in the future for about another 10 years. And at the same time, kind of talk about how we've taken what we've developed at, in uh, the US through this program called CPTAC. And now we've sort of expanded it and it's really nice to see how India has become the latest partner within this international effort. So let me do this. The first slide that I'm going to do is sort of a cartoon because there was this one presentation that I saw two days ago and people were quite nice and they were very scientific. Okay? And they explained to you genotype, they explained to you the genes, then they talked about phenotype. But here's my simplistic perspective of trying to understand a genotype and how it rolls up ultimately to a phenotype, which is what you want to get your hands on. So imagine if you're at the gym. So in a way, if you want to look at what genotype is, which is going to, which is going to be representative of your genomes, 
This in a way could actually be your genome, which is your genotype, which kind of tries to represent, it's your blueprint. And obviously when you have a blueprint, what you're trying to do is to say, this is what I could potentially could become. That is your genotype, all the potential is there. But as people know, we all aspire to do certain things and sometimes those things actually don't come to fruition. So the reality is your genotype, which is what you wish to become, as in this individual, which is Arnold Schwarzenegger, the phenotype, which is actually your functional space, and you, and you, you can kind of look at it as your proteome, this could actually become your phenotype. So not always do you get what you want, to put it in a good way. However though, that's actually okay. Because I think ultimately to understand the different states between the genotype and the phenotype, it becomes really important to begin to blend these worlds together. Quite frankly, I think if you, if you study only the genome and then you ignore the proteome, or quite, if you look at the proteome, completely ignore the genome, you're going to be missing a tremendous amount of biology. And I hope in the next 40 minutes I could give you an example on how now we've seen that in the space of oncology that that is the case. So more and more as technologies are becoming very mature, we're starting to blend these worlds together. So this is the history sort of the genome that I see it from the perspective of the National Cancer Institute. So I actually got recruited to NCI just about 12 years ago. And one of the things that I kind of liked about it is, is that I love organizations that enjoy taking risk. So for a very conservative or organization, they kind of did take a risk politically because it, because it did cost a lot, a lot of, of uh, finances in the, space of, in the space of omics based research. And if anyone talks about genomics, a lot of people will talk about the Cancer Genome Atlas. So the Cancer Genome Atlas actually gets officially launched in 2006. So the dates now become very important here. And TCGA, in a span of 10 years, of course they had a lot of capital to do this, but in a span of 10 years they did an amazing uh, thing. They basically cataloged about 34 different cancer types. These are all solid tumors, and they actually went through about just a little bit over 14,000 individuals to achieve that goal. And all the information, they placed it in the public domain. So that's good. Here's the part that a lot of people don't know about the history of NCI. Actually, when they were actually trying to come up with this idea, well, do we look at the genomics? They all along did not want to do genomics in isolation. They actually did want to go after the proteomics space. And, in that, and, and actually what they ended up doing was at the same time that they launched the Cancer Genome Atlas, which was mandated to go after biology, they launched a proteomic-based effort. Now, a lot of people knew about it, but that program at the time, which is now today kind of known as, is referred to as CPTAP. Now, the reason they want to do it was quite simplistic. In the early 2000s, the first draft of the Human Genome uh, 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 Project gets released. Again, it's a draft, but that really raised the interest of a lot of oncologists in the U.S., especially our cancer center directors. And they basically did these series of workshops, and one of the things that came out of these workshops, they said, we need to now begin to explore omic-based technologies in cataloging different cancer types. And they made it very clear. We want to go after genomics and proteomics. Now, why proteomics? Well, the first one you kind of would actually understand, which is what was talked about in the days prior, was you need to get an understanding of the underlying biology of that disease. And if you talk about biology, trying to understand the different pathways and not just taking your RNA-seq data and computationally predicting from a, a bioinformatics perspective, what the abundance are of proteins, or more specifically, what those modifications would be, it's never a one-to-one -one correlation. So they knew they had to understand the underlying biology before any of the biology could even move, potentially, towards patient care. The other reason was, is exactly what I said, patient care. If you ignore the space of IO, which is uh, uh, immuno-oncology, the vast majority of all our patients are still being treated with compounds that are typically uh, chemo-based. And those compounds actually don't target, in fact, the vast majority of them don't target DNA. There's very few that play this idea of intercalating the DNA. The vast majority will always go after a protein. So they need to understand, not just, hey, my target binds here, but again, trying to understand off-target sites and all the wiring of the biology and all the off rows that you could get. But here's now what happens. Around 2003, Using the instrument of a mass spectrometer, a publication gets released into the public, and that actually looks at early stage ovarian cancer. They actually did not identify the proteins that they were measuring. They basically looked at these pattern recognitions. And based upon that, they basically argue that simply, simply looking at proteins by a pattern, ignoring the genomics information, we're able to identify early stage ovarian cancer, and I think they talked about like 90% specificity with a 90% 
of uh, uh, specificity built in, which is incredible if you think about it, because not even that existed within the DNA diagnostic space. Well, it turned out it was too good to be true. There were errors at all levels of this. So what the NCI decided to do was, when it came to proteomics, they did not move forward in 2006 when they created this to go after biology. That was taken off the table. So they, they basically wanted to go after the analytics and determine, can you standardize these powerful next generation methodologies, uh, predominantly a mass spectrometer, and if you can, then you would come back to our board, you would give us the confidence that we could trust the measurements. In other words, what you're measuring is going to be representative of the biology you're trying to go after. It's not going to be attributed to an artifact, attributed to the way the sample is collected or the way you're processing your sample. Okay, because that's very important. Everybody's going to measure something. But you've got to ask yourself, is what you're measuring going to be representative of the biology of a disease state? Or is it an artifact? Because if it's an artifact, it won't go towards patient care, most likely. And then if you could do that, you could go after biology. So for the very first five years, we had to try to standardize as much as we can. I'm not going to go, go, go through all the science, but here's what we ended up doing. We basically carved the space of proteomics exactly like you do in genomics. In genomics, you first do a comprehensive characterization. Once you identify what you want, then you basically develop targeted panels. So targeted panels that today actually drives a lot of our patient care, especially within the clinical trial space. So when it came to proteomics, we decided to take a very similar based approach. If you do a deep dive, that's basically what a lot of people refer to as shotgun. I'm not a fan of that terminology. So basically, I tend to call it very deep comprehensive coverage. You're trying to measure as many things as you can. And there we basically showed if you distributed a standard operating procedure amongst multiple laboratories, guess what? You get very good concordance, type CVs, typically less than 15%, and sometimes even less than 10%, which is very good. Then we wanted to explore the space of targeted mass spectrometry, because once you identify the large landscape, you don't want to do this comprehensive-based approach all the time. It's very high cost, it's low throughput, and it requires a lot of sample. So you want to get something that's going to be very locked down. And for lockdown, you typically want a targeted-based assay. So in that space, we basically at the time looked at what's now referred to as multiple reaction monitoring. And you have different uh, ways of phrasing this. Never invented it. This existed in clinical labs for 30 years. They basically use it for measurement of small molecules. We basically want to ask the question, if you roll it up to a peptide, can you use it in that space and is it reproducible and more importantly can you transfer the technology across laboratories and get very good tight measurements. So what we ended up doing, we basically looked at multiple reaction monitoring, we did a series of round robin studies. One involved eight laboratories in the US, we got very good results. Another one then we did an international study, labs on the east coast, west coast of the US and we had a lab in Asia. Again, very good results that, that, that uh, we obtained from that. People was talking about Skyline a couple of days ago. So Skyline is actually a little product that came from one of our laboratories when we were actually creating this program. It's a great little tool and it shows you how from basic science you could get uh, a, a computational product that's now is being used broadly by the research community. The other thing we started to ask is, well what if, what if you could take your technology and you could potentially move it a little bit further towards regulatory approval? because ultimately that's the goal. You want to put it in a clinical laboratory and hopefully use the information to go back towards patient care. In the US, that's the Food and Drug Administration. So typically to get a device cleared as an IVD MIA, you need to go through the FDA and there's two stages behind it. A very first one is what we refer to as a 510K document. What happened in the past was typically a manufacturer will submit it, it gets all marked up by the Food and Drug Administration and then they give it back to the submitter. But the submitter never wants to release it we were very interested in releasing all that information to the public. So what we ended up doing was we held a workshop with the regulatory agency and we basically made up all the data, but we did not make up the analytical workflows. The beauty of that was it allowed us then to submit all our data to the regulatory agency as an official filing. They marked it up like they would for any device manufacturer, but because we submitted it and we made up the data, then we were able to take the document and we published it in the public domain. We actually got it published in, in, uh, in uh, clinical chemistry because we partnered with the American Association for Clinical Chemistry in the United States. The other stuff we, we realized early on, a lot of the commercial grade reagents that are out there in the community were not to the standards we felt they should have been. So we've worked with the commercial sector trying to raise the sort of quality of the products that they released. And then the other one was, a lot of people talk about, I've developed a targeted based assay. I'll be honest. After a while, a lot of us did not know what that even meant. 
because people develop assays and you find out what they mean is that they've either, they've either developed a theoretical assay or they developed the assay running it in buffer. The last I checked, if you draw blood or a tissue from a patient, it's not theoretical and there's no buffer flowing in that system. So we wanted to develop a clinical based way of thinking about it. So basically it's a fit for purpose based criteria. And we actually did that. And what's quite nice about it, in, in a very simplistic manner, you, you could kind of see it as the following. We developed tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one is basically a clinical uh, grade assay. We don't do that within our program. Tier three, there's less analytical rigor involved in that when you have to submit these sorts of uh, criteria. But tier two is a nice little sweet spot that everything within the CPTEC program we actually adhere. What's quite nice is that this ultimately now got picked up by the molecular, uh, uh, cellular and proteomics as a journal and also by the international community. So anytime you now submit to this journal and you say that you've developed a targeted based assay, you, t you will have to adhere and describe your assay based on one of these analytical tiers. So with this in, now, now with this, th this is a five year window. At this point, we go back to the board of NCI. We, we actually demonstrated that we were able to get very good analytical understanding of these technologies, predominantly mass spectrometry. And now we get approved to move it to the next stage. And that next stage was interesting. We wanted to explore as a pilot to go after biology. The biology we wanted to go after was specifically the cancer genome atlas. Because that started biology five years before us, we're five years behind. And the way we basically phrased it to the board was, we want the exact tumor that just went from a patient to the cancer genome atlas and was comprehensively characterized and we'll take it. And then we're going to put a comprehensive proteomic characterization right above it. And ultimately what we're trying to find out is are you able to identify additional biology that is either difficult to obtain or simply not feasible through genomics. So think about it because if what you come out of that sort of a finding is I could confirm what my genomic colleagues just found it's going to be very difficult to convince people proteomic has a role because proteomics costs more and it's lower throughput and does require a higher amount of sample input. So that was the goal. Can you find additional biology, pure and simple? So here's kind of what we ended up doing. We went after three cancer types of TCGA. We went after colorectal cancer, ovarian cancer, and breast cancer. On average, about 100 individuals per each one of our studies. Suffice to say, here's the overall highlights in every one of these we found new biology. Now here's sort of a little example of what I mean by finding additional biology. If you look at the ovarian study, this is just one little slide that comes out of that paper. So in the Cancer Genome Atlas, we actually cataloged just shy of 500 patients to come up with the, with the observations that we did for ovarian cancer. And in that, they did a whole series of, of, of uh, analytical different ways of looking at the data sets. So what our investigators had an interest in is if you look at the proteomics landscape are able to, to tease out two features that's associated with ovarian cancer. One's going to be overall survival. Typically you wanted to find out if you could separate short versus long term, less than three, more than five years. And at the same time they were, they were interested in homologous recombination deficiency or brockiness as it's, it's commonly referred to as. So what they ended up doing was the following. Out of the 500, we took approximately shy of 200 of those samples and we distributed to two laboratories. They were blinded to what the samples were. And they performed a whole series of bioinformatics on the information. One of the things they did was a consensus clustering, kind of analogous to what's done at the RNA-seq level. And the question is, if you look at the information at the protein landscape, when you're looking at protein abundance, what do you get? Is it going to be different or will you simply confirm what you did at the transcriptomic level? So here's what they found out. Not only do you confirm, but you're also to infer additional biology. So out of the four initial subtypes that you get at the transcriptomic level, they nicely roll up to the protein level. But in addition to that, they identified a, diff, a, 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 a additional subtype that's identified here. This one they simply refer to as stromal because a lot of these proteins tend to be associated with things like angiogenesis. But again, the key of this study that they had an interest in when they got these samples, they wanted to identify can the protein information at abundance level separate out for me either overall survival or HRD status? And it actually it turned out the answer was no. So protein abundance in itself in this type of an analysis could not separate overall survival 
or HRD status. But that actually wasn't bad and here's why. Because the same type of analysis was performed by TCGA either in their flagship study or an additional study down the road that TCGA did and they also cannot identify those two criteria. Now here's why it, it gets interesting. So these investigators, they had an advantage. They had genomics based data from TCGA and we had protein information. They also had modified proteins at the same time. And as opposed to be asking these questions and trying to analyze the information from a gene based level way of thinking, they wanted to roll up the information into biological pathways. So what they ended up doing was they took all the data and then they plugged it into the Insight Pathway Interaction Database and they identified just over 200 sig sig uh, signaling pathways. Now just focusing on the feature of overall survival, they asked a simple question. Can I use the information now looking at cellular pathways and try to separate short versus long term survival? So here's what they get. Looking at protein abundance, well it turns out five pathways all of a sudden rise up to the top from those uh, just over 200. If you normalize against abundance and now look at phosphorylation, an additional five pathways became apparent. There's a nice crosstalk between one of these uh, growth factor receptor pathways. But because we also had TCGA data from the same tumor, we also, we also analyzed it at the RNA-seq level. A different pathway came up. Now you, you could begin to see what started happening to our program. In other words, if you were to perform an experiment either looking at only protein abundance and you're done, or you want to look at phosphorylation and nothing else, or you just want to look at genomics, most likely you're going to be looking at an incomplete picture of the underlying biology for this study that we were, that, that we were involved in. So that became sort of a very turning point for us. So at the end of the day what we learned from this was if you have the opportunity as these technologies are now maturing you can begin to actually perform comprehensive genomics with proteomics at the same time, most likely blending these worlds together is going to give you a better understanding not only of the underlying biology of the disease but we hope, we hope that the biology could potentially translate towards patient care. Now, in addition also to be developing very detailed pathway uh, uh, based maps as is shown here, you can also begin to tease out those funky features that people like to look at. So for example, this looks at uh, the, uh, what, what is it, for the growth uh, uh, factor receptor pathway, a very commonly looked at transcription factor turns out to be STAT5A. And actually by rolling both informations together, if it's not that obvious here, basically what we showed was at the transcriptomic level looking at overall survival, not much change. At the protein abundance level, it kind of resembled at that point what you found at the transcriptomic, maybe a slight little bump and nothing really that's going to be significant, but really you saw a huge increase at the level of, of phosphorylation. So again, three cancer types that we did, all similar observations. So here's now what starts to happen and I've seen this question being asked also in the past couple of days. So now we have standardization first five years, the next five years which we, which we just wrapped up focus on trying to tease up biology and we had to go back to our board. And what people kept on asking is the same thing that people were asking for, for the past two days. And that's the following. Wow, so which one's going to be better? Should I only do genomics or should I only do proteomics? Should I do proteomics and completely alone genomics? Which one's better between the two? So the way that I kind of viewed it was just take yourself back to a book of biochemistry. The first thing you learn is that everything has to relate to one another. And if you could get a, a, a good comprehensive systems perspective view of that biology, hopefully it's going to be more representative of the disease state itself. So for us the answer became no. I seriously doubt if you don't understand any of the biology of what you're going after, why do you want to go after one of these omics now when the technologies have become quite mature. And here's why, which is what's the same argument that I made to the board about four years ago. If you look at the Cancer Genome Atlas, again the Cancer Genome Atlas, I'm a huge fan of this program simply for what it, it was able to achieve in a 10 year window. They went after 34 cancer types, just over 14,000 individuals and in the process they found a lot of interesting biology, again you can't put clinical context behind this because the samples are never collected with a clinical question in mind, but nevertheless a very good resource that's been given to the public at large. But in that they also identified a whole series of actionable mutations that now some of our small molecules is actually driving a lot of our precision oncology trials. So that's the good news. Now you can actually look at the other side of your story which is what we're learning now four years down the road in running a lot of these very precision oncology trials. 
What we're learning is that a lot of these tumors that they had these action limitations that we develop all these GMP facilities to develop these small molecules, those individuals actually are really not responding long term to the therapy that they're being administered. If they do respond, it's short term and a lot of them actually develop toxicity. They got to take it from one treatment arm and then quickly move them into another. Why? We have no idea why. That's the bottom line. So for me, what that tells me is that there's still a tremendous amount of missing biology strictly focusing on a one omic based approach. Now you can actually flip the coin, just look at what's going on within the therapeutic perspective. So this is a nice little paper that people could look it up, it's by a colleague named Tito Fo who used to be at the NCI and now moved to New York City, but he did basically this little analysis where he looked at solid tumors and what Tito did was actually quite savvy. He went in the public domain and he said look, if you look at the first main precision oncology drug that came out which is Gleevec along with Herceptin in the early 2000s and what's transpired so over the past 15 years, there's, just, there's about over 70 of these drugs now. And if you look at the drugs for all the different cancer types that they're, that, that they're being used either as a single or in combination, on average, just on average, what's the two main criteria that people look at? Either overall survival or progression free survival. Now you exclude it from this study obviously the exceptional responders. And what you found out is for all these therapies on average for both of these different metrics it's typically no more than three months. So this played a big role the way that CPTAC now evolved in, in, in its current round. We still go after biology like we did when the prior program but now we're slowly trying to move into that translational space. So this is CPTAC today. So CPTAC is still held responsible to characterize deep comprehensive genomic characterization along with proteomic characterization for five additional cancer types. And all the information we put in, in the public domain because we see it as pre-competitive. At the same time for the very first time the National Cancer Institute has now partnered a proteomics laboratory with an ongoing precision oncology typically genomically driven NCI sponsored clinical trial. Now what's interesting there is that the information is not going to go back to a tumor board to figure out exactly what treatment arm or what therapy to administer to a patient. On the other hand the information is basically going to be used in a reverse engineering manner. So based on the study itself you'll be able to get samples from these trials which are very well controlled so the amount of clinical inference you're able to pull out of it is tremendous and you'll get pre, during and post. And hopefully what we uh, hope to learn from that program is if the individual did not respond to the way we think they should have responded based on the genomic information, can we identify the biology to the root cause of that by looking at the protein landscape of those subjects. And if that turns out to be very revealing, my goal is that in the next iteration, we want to combine those two worlds, fuse them together and actually go directly now to our tumor boards. Now, in terms of how old is the current CPTEC program, actually it's not that old. So in terms of the comprehensive characterization that's now two years old as a program or young as I like to say because I've reached my middle age crisis so I don't like to use the word old anymore and the one of the translational now is one year young. So what have we done over the past two years because that's really a two year window that the program's been around. So, so here's what we ended up doing. These programs are very complex. The reality is you just can't get something off the ground and expect it to work. You have to build your infrastructure. So the first one that we launched was the, was the characterization component. The first thing we realized is that we, we had three main of what we call data production facilities or sites. And we tried then to try to standardize the best we can or harmonize the analytical workflows of the way that they would be producing those data sets. So that became very important for us and that pretty much took about a 12 month cycle for us. At the same time they also released an additional three data sets to the public which is sort of a continuance of the last program but these are now freshly collected samples that have been optimized for both comprehensive genomic characterization and comprehensive proteomic characterization and that has to be for colorectal cancer, breast cancer and ovarian cancer. In the second year of our program we officially launched our translational arms, those are our partnerships with our clinical trials and at the same time we also then continued in terms of that brute force characterization arm and we released an additional four data sets to the public. One, well two of them actually, well in fact all of them occurred in the fall of this calendar year, colorectal cancer we released, endometrial cancer we released and we also released two additional pilot studies 
one focusing on 30-year-old samples, just trying to understand the stability of these bank materials, and the other one was sort of a cell line study. And we hope to release another one in the, in, in the next several weeks. Now, I talk about a lot, we give all this information to the public. The other question I get all the time is, okay, so you give all this stuff to the public, is it being used? It's like developing a business, right? If you guys develop a business and if nobody comes to your store and, and actually uses your products, your store typically won't stay in business too long. So I'm always paranoid, you know, are people going to use these materials? I would argue giving away your data and everything you find in a pre-competitive manner is truly advantageous. Not for your own program, but at the same time for, for the globe as a whole. And for three basic reasons. One, if you give away the, the, the raw material, just data sets, reagents, your standard operating procedures, it stimulates outside individuals that don't have wet laboratories that are computational scientists that could reanalyze your data sets and hopefully develop new hypotheses to pursue science in a way that you couldn't figure that out a couple of years in the past. Secondly, if you could take your raw ingredients, work with industry to develop kits, you could further disseminate that to the public. And thirdly, you hope that some of these kits or the reagents, you could put them in a way together that actually could be used in a clinical setting. So let me give you an example of all three of them. So in terms of our data, do people use the data sets of CPTAC? It turns out it does. It's very, it's very simple to get analytic metrics on it. So our program has about 10 terabytes worth of raw and processed data files available to the public as of today. We know that our data is being downloaded all over the world, specifically just over 130 countries. And actually of the small little 10 terabytes worth of raw files, that, those downloads have now exceeded, well almost have reached 300 terabytes worth equivalent of our data sets. In terms of the other components that I talked about, we also give away assays for those targeted based uh, assays that we develop. So we have a portal, we give away all the parameters behind the assays that we develop. We currently have just over 1,500 of these fit for purpose based assays. Do people go to our website? Yes. It turns out on a monthly basis, over 8,000 people are now going to our website and they're grabbing whatever information they want, hopefully conducting studies in their own laboratories. And actually those download sites come from almost 180 countries. The vast majority of the assays actually do come from CPTAC, but as we develop these analytical criteria for the public, we're starting to allow outside investigators to deposit their own assays within our own portal. Now some of these assays do require a higher level of sensitivity if you want to measure endogenous levels in individuals. So for that we do develop reagents. Those are antibodies. So in antibodies we have almost 500 monoclonal antibodies that we've developed and fully characterized. We give away all the characterization in the public and we give it away through different distribution arms. One, we, one distribution arm is at very low cost through the academic model and the other one is through industry. And we've been able to sell these units. So we've now sold almost, what, uh, 4,000 units of our antibodies, which is really good for this little small program out of the National Cancer Institute. And of course, we just don't do proteomics in isolation, we do genomics. And we do imaging, so all the imaging that comes from the histopathology lab or from the radiology lab, we give it away into the public domain. So it's not just proteomics, we do genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and imaging, everything we put it in the public. Now, another great example is this recent study. In fact, I ended up getting this paper from the director of my institute about a couple of weeks ago, and his comment was, have you seen this? It was flattering that somebody else saw it and not me, and here's why. It's a neat little study. So our program really wasn't looking at neoantigens. Neoantigens is like this hot little terminology that people use now, basically looking at mutated components. But at the end of the day, this study comes out in cancer cell uh, in uh, late summer, and what they looked at was neoantigens, but they looked at publicly accessible data sets, it turns out. Obviously, the one that typically people will think about is the cancer genome atlas. But the part that I liked about it was, is that on the front cover, if you look at the image that they had, the data sets that they pulled out to conduct their analysis actually comes from the US-based CPTAC program. Why? Only because we place it in the public domain. So there's a great example on how giving up the information, we never explored neoantigens within our data sets. Another investigator group is able to do it for us. And again, it further stimulates the science world. Now, these are raw ingredients. What do you work with industry to develop small kits? So one of our colleagues is in Canada. Uh, MRM proteomics. So MRM proteomics develops kits. 
And these are targeted based assays. And one of the things they wanted to know was how do they differentiate themselves from other manufacturers. Our comment was you might want to look at our analytical criteria, and if you are able to adhere to them, we'll host your assays on our own portal, further drives traffic towards your company, and at the same time you put out a kit that has a higher level of standardization than typically what's out there within the research landscape. And that's exactly what they did. So actually when they now put out kits that they actually run it as an in-house service or they, you could actually purchase your kits and run it within your core facility. These are all research use only. Right there it will basically tell you that they adhere to the CP Tech guidelines for their analytical kits themselves. Now, this is still the research space. What about the translational space in developing these targeted based assays? Here's a great little study that actually came out a, a couple of weeks ago and this is a partnership from, from one of our laboratories on the west coast that actually partnered with AstraZeneca. And here's a great example how proteomics helps the therapeutic side of the landscape. So in this one what they were looking at is two compounds. These are basically tyrosine kinase inhibitors and they're after two pathways, ataxias, that, are, that has a lot of affiliation with DNA damage response. But basically the, this investigator, Amanda Polovich at the HUD, she developed a targeted based assay that looks at the DNA damage response. That was a huge advantage for AstraZeneca. And in the partnership what they ended up doing was they actually then identified a marker and this is a pharmacodynamic marker. That PD marker actually helped AstraZeneca move these two compounds from a phase one study using now this PD marker and they're able to translate it into a phase two. And it's being used to, to actually determine the dose that actually is going to be administered to these individuals. Now this is still the translational space. Can you get it in a clinical environment? We've actually played in that space. Here's one example. Now here's one where a lot of people try to find new biomarkers, but again that's very complicated because you're trying to figure out new biology and believe me, new biology towards patient care takes many years, but that's okay because biology is complicated. So what we decided to do was to take the analytical techniques that we've developed and ask clinical laboratories are there existing tests that are problematic that might be alleviated if you were to bring this orthogonal measurement into your portfolio. And in this case they went after thyroglobulin. The reason they went after it is that you find out about 20% of the population individuals with, with uh, thyroglobulin, they actually suffer from autoantibodies. The autoantibodies, the issue with that is, is that it's going to interfere with the secondary antibody of an ELISA. So you get a lot of hook effects and basically you end up with false positives. So to circumvent the 20% of the population that's missing out on a very good test, we uh, actually our investigators ended up developing a targeted mass spec assay dedicated against thyroglobulin itself. That test today now is being used by every major clinical reference laboratory in the United States. Now this is still being used as a laboratory developed test. What if you wanted to take it to the FDA and get something approved? That's a whole regulatory path. Well that's an interesting space. So this is what our investigators are now doing within this environment. It turns out when you go directly back to the FDA, they'll say well mass spectrometry, we don't develop the standards or we don't tell people what to do. We look at the community to come up with a consensus document. Once we understood the process we said so what's one of the communities you look at? It turns out there's an organization referred to as CLSI which is the, cl which, which is the Clinical Laboratory Standards uh, Institute. Uh, aspects and what we ended up doing was the following. In 2016 we worked with the FDA to put on a workshop dedicated toward mass spectrometry. Not, again, not mass spectrometry for metabolites but to move it into the measurement of this, in this case your measurement was going to be a peptide. That, uh, that ultimately then led in early of 2018 to an existing governing body of CLSI. So they've always had historically a document referred to as C62A for using mass spectrometry in a clinical setting for the measurement of metabolites but not for peptides. We're now working with them to develop one dedicated to the measurement of peptides. And the goal is hopefully within the year 2020, it takes a lot of time apparently, but in 2020 they're going to release a document that's dedicated for the measurement of peptides. Which is, a lot, which is basically the targeted mass spec that a lot of people have been referring to. Now the other question I get is, well are these technologies very specific to cancer? It turns out they're not. Technology is ambivalent, that's the beauty of it. So here's a great example of it. So at the, Nas uh, so at the National Institutes of Health, 
I belong to the National Cancer Institute. One of my sister institutes, the National Institute of Diabetes, they basically put out a funding solicitation early this calendar year. The reason I loved it was the following when we found it. They talked about is that they're, is that they're going to be funding laboratories in the U.S. to develop targeted based assays against, I believe, type 1 diabetes. Yes. But that's not the part that's interesting, is taking proteomics into diabetes. The part that we liked the most was they basically said it. When you develop your targeted based assays, you have to adhere to the guidelines developed by the National Cancer Institute CPTAC program. And more importantly, you have to deposit the analytical criteria of your assays in the public domain. So it sets a precedent for other people to be replicating that process. Now, CPTAC, I pretty much don't do anything in the program. I have to admit, I have the pleasure of being at the National Cancer Institute and overseeing this effort. This is really a team-based program, and this involves multiple institutions within the United States, just a series of incredibly talented scientists. It's been one of the most privileges I've had over the past 12 years. But now, this program actually has spawned this other sorts of initiatives of blending these two worlds together. I hope after listening to today's lecture, you are convinced that whether to choose genomics or proteomics, which one is better? Probably you will not ask this question anymore and you will agree that both of these technologies are good, but probably a good integration of proteogenomics could provide us much more meaningful information. Dr. Rodriguez provided very good example that if you open a biology book, what you find is the correlation which defines the complexity. So, both genomics and proteomics need to be understand thoroughly so that we can understand important questions for disease biology. That means, we all need to focus on the new area which is proteogenomics. I hope you also heard various pathway networking correlation in the ovarian cancer project which shows new aspects, new information could be obtained using proteogenomics and phosphoproteomic analysis. He also provided you brief overview of CPTAC data portal which contains large number of data from 130 countries worldwide. Finally, he provided highlights of some of the facts which are related to the targeted proteomics and how CPTAC is coming forward with different guidelines to standardize these assays. In the next lecture by Dr. Henry Rodriguez, he will talk about other programs and initiatives which are generating and managing multimodal data other than CPTAC. He will also brief about data common framework and cancer research. Thank you.